Well, welcome to our uh, next devotion in the book of Romans. This morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 2. We're going to make it from verse 1 to verse 5. Because in verse 6 there's going to be a shift. Uh, n not a section shift, but a discernible shift uh, in Paul's language. And we have to do a little bit of background as we get into chapter 2. So with that, let's go ahead and start this devotion, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, uh, chapter 2 begins with therefore, which is a conjunction. It links what Paul's about to say with what Paul has already said. And one of the difficulties in preaching and in teaching is we often have to break Paul into sections like this, where I'm breaking Paul into five verses. Uh, and that's not necessarily fair to Paul's continual idea, because Paul is building a argument. He started in chapter one. He's going to continue building this argument. And what Paul is about to do, beginning here in chapter two, is he's going to engage in a writing style that's called a diatribe. Uh, it's arguing against someone or something. It's a bit of a rhetorical device. It's not unlike if you've ever had an argument with somebody in your head. Um, that's not unlike what Paul's about to do. He's about to engage in an argument with several invisible opponents. And the invisible opponent is going to have a position, and Paul is going to address that position. Now, this comes up in, in different ways. It comes up sometimes as a rhetorical question. Paul sometimes is perhaps parroting or um, uh, presenting a fictional speech by one of his invisible opponents. Where did Paul come up with these arguments against his preaching of the gospel? Well, I want to remind you that in the book of Acts, after Paul's conversion, immediately after Paul's conversion, and uh, he's baptized and he begins to preach Jesus right there in Damascus. Uh, and so he's engaging Jews in a debate that Jesus, uh, the, the, the carpenter turned Messiah figure who was crucified, is actually the Messiah, and that he's a raised Messiah, which of course uh, is a completely thoroughly un-Jewish Second Temple thought. So right away, Paul has to engage Jews, and you see this throughout uh, Paul's missionary endeavors, uh, Acts chapter 9, chapter 13, chapter 14. He's engaging with Jews primarily, uh, but he is the uh, apostle to the Gentiles, and you'll remember that in Acts chapter 17, Paul ends up at the Areopagus, which is kind of the the Greek center of thought. And it's over this career, remember that the book of Romans is probably written at the end of the third missionary journey. Paul has engaged how many people over the years, Gentile and Jew, and he's probably heard people object. Well, wait a minute, Paul, what about this? Well, wait a minute, Paul, you said this. Does that mean da 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 da? And that's the thing about a diatribe. It can uh, take on rhetorical questions. It could be parody in a sense. It could be fictional speeches by uh, your adversary. Now, here I can speak uh, to some experience. I have a personal thought regarding baptism, regarding Baptizing somebody who is young in age and not having parental involvement in, the, in that baptism. And I'm not necessarily in favor of doing things of that nature. Uh, I brought this topic up on four different occasions to four different audiences. The first time uh, was with a, a pastor in my own tradition, and so that. Uh, the second time was with a group of youth pastors uh, who represent a quite a quite a span of tradition and traditions and backgrounds. I do have to say everybody was believers baptism. We didn't have any pedo Baptist voices present at this. The next time was with somebody who's a member of a contemporary religious movement. Now what I mean by that is I don't particularly find the word cult a helpful term. Uh, this this uh, his his religion 
is one of those that cropped up here in the U.S. within the last 200 or 300 years. Uh, oftentimes, people call his group and, and groups like his cults. I'm not sure that that's a helpful term. And so uh, he's a member of a, a contemporary religious movement that has particular views on baptism and so forth. And the fourth time I engaged this conversation and brought up my point was with somebody who I would describe as irreligious, who had some form of a background that involved uh, the sinner's prayer and involved uh, once saved, always saved, which I believe is, is a horrible perversion of what uh, Calvin actually taught. But that's a different thing. Each time I was engaged in these four different discussions, I brought up an illustration and I lost my audience each time I brought up this illustration. And it makes me realize that if ever I was to talk about this and bring up this illustration, I either need to be willing to, to, to defend my illustration, which unfortunately gets us off topic, or two, I need to come up with a better illustration that keeps us on the actual topic of baptism. So with that, I've engaged four times and I've seen all four of these diverse audiences, now admittedly all, all four were Americans, which explains how I lost them on this particular topic. But that being said, um, Paul has engaged this numerous times, and these, the arguments that he brings up here in the book of Romans, are probably arguments that he has dealt with, that he uh, has engaged with, either from a Jew or from a Gentile. Uh, now, one more thing about this diatribe, Paul is going to refer to somebody as you. He's going to use the second person personal pronoun, you, uh, starting here in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, based on verses 1 through 16, it could be a Jewish Christian. It's more likely that it's a Gentile Christian or Gentile Christians in the plural. Uh, now, I, I believe that that could be intentional because Paul then leaves it open to anybody. This section could apply to either to the Jew or to the Gentile. And what Paul is about to say of them is that they are judgmental. Now, uh, Jesus said in the, the parable, uh, uh, excuse me, on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge. And when we think about that, um, that, that is something that we then take to heart. And we wonder, is there any time then that we should judge somebody? Well, in the very same chapter, chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 20, Jesus is talking about false prophets, and you will recognize them by their fruits, which means you are judging them based on what they are doing, how you see, what, what fruits you see coming out of their, their life. And so there must be, within Jesus' uh, uh, picture, there must be some judgments that are uh, within your scope, within uh, uh, allowability. Now, now, that being said, we then look at Paul, and I think that we see Paul judging uh, at times. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is judging somebody engaged in sexual immorality and telling the church, you need to put this fellow out of your, your fellowship because of this sexual immorality. So, uh, so this judge not... Uh, no judging uh, is a bit of a false dilemma. There has to be some form of judging that is allowed. Now, what type of judgment? Well, I think we'll get into Paul here in a moment, but I do want to point out one more time. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, we, we have Jesus speaking to the Apostle John, and he's writing these letters to the seven churches uh, there in Asia Minor. The first letter uh, to Ephesus, there's somebody claiming to be an apostle, and he's, he, he's been found to be false, which means they've had to judge him in some way, and that judgment showed that uh, these people who, who claim to be apostles are false. Now, uh, in, in the letter to Pergama, there's some teachers who follow the teaching of Balaam, which is probably meaning uh, they... they Balaam is an archetype for them. And whatever it is that they are teaching, uh, based on Jesus' words, they're encouraging people to engage in sexual immorality. Now, the same thing is happening in Thyatira. 
uh, some prophetess is teaching Christians to commit sexual immorality. And so you see Jesus uh, judging these, these churches for tolerating uh, these kinds of teachings within their ranks, which once again means that there is some form of judgment that's required of the Christian. It probably has to do with, like Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. And so when you look at the fruit that comes out of their Christian walk, if that reflects much more uh, sexual immorality or other types of immorality, um, then it's probably wise of you to judge not to follow their example. Judge not to follow them. With that said, let's go ahead and jump in here at uh, Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Therefore you, here is our, our imaginary opponent, you, therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you, uh, for you who judge part, practice the same thing things. Verse 2, and we know that the judgments of God rightly fall upon those who practice such things. Uh, whoever this you is, wh whether it's a, uh, a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, Paul is addressing them, and it specifically points out that they are judging people although they do the exact same thing that they're condemning others for doing. Uh, in verse 2, Paul introduces another group, the we, uh, which he would include himself in, and he's probably including his audience in. We uh, know that God's judgment rightly falls on people who do such things. And so there too, we see that in verse 1, there's a judgment that involves uh, people who practice the same sin but judging others. We also see in verse 2 there's a type of judgment that you're in agreement that people who commit such things, when the judgment of God falls upon them, it's right that the, the, God, uh, that the judgment of God falls upon them. So this is an interesting dilemma. There's some type of judgment that's wrong and there's some type of judgment that's right and we're going to get more into what Paul specifically says about uh, the wrong uh, verse 3 but do you suppose this old man excuse me old man when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you will escape the judgment of God verse 4 or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Now, this is very strong language going on here in verses uh, 3 through 4. Um, he's addressing, the again, the you, uh, the, the you that judges another, but also the you that does the same thing that they judge in another person. Now, what do we generally call that when we know of somebody who uh, thinks that that's wrong, but then they go ahead and do it anyways? We usually call a person like that a hypocrite, don't we? Now, Paul says something very strict here, and I think everybody needs to, to pay attention to Paul's words here. They are condemning themselves, but they're convinced that they will escape God's judgment. Now, this is a, a very serious thing. Whoever the you is in this section, they are a type of moralist who believes that certain sins are, of course, wrong. And it's wrong for people to commit those. But almost in that, well, it's wrong for you to commit that, but it's not wrong for me to commit that. Now, we've got to wonder what exactly it is that would lead a person to think it's wrong for others to commit this sin, but it's okay for me to commit this sin. What would be reasons that people might give for thou shalt not applies to you, but thou shalt not does not apply to me? Or perhaps what theology is standing behind them, suggesting to them that it's okay to continue in sin because you have some form of a relationship with God that although you sin, 
you're going to get out of this judgment to come. Now, verse 4 is a very scary verse, and I want to read it one more time. Or do you think lightly of his kindness, of God's kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? I hope that all of us can earnestly and honestly answer no to Paul's question here in uh, verse 4. Uh, I, I think about my own life, and I think about my life before Christ, and how I did engage in numerous sins, and, and the point here is not to uh, um, engage in a, a, a list of who, whose sins list is, is longer, but I have to say that there were so many times along that way that God could have smited me, smitten me, right at that very moment. And yet God didn't smite me at that moment. He let me continue on on my path, and my path eventually led me to repenting of my sins and turning to God, uh, being forgiven in Jesus Christ. And I think that that's something that Christians need to have in themselves in our day and age. Yes, it's very easy to turn on the TV and to see this celebrity or this politician or this quasi-celebrity uh, who, who engages in these kinds of sin and who does that kind of thing and does this and does that. It's also very easy to see, you know, probably in your own life, people who engage in sin. And to jump to the conclusion of, well, their condemnation when God judges them, it's going to be deserved. But for some reason, when God didn't judge me, it, it must be because I'm such a nice person. God just liked me so much. No, God's, God has had mercy on me. He gave me all of that time to repent. I did repent. I did respond. And I believe that that needs to be our attitude to this sinful and fallen world. That although they are sinning, that... God is being patient with them. Now, remember that Paul said that the wrath of God is present tense being poured out, and I think that that's true, and I think that we see that in people facing consequences for their sins. But hopefully, those consequences for them sin, for their sins will wake them up enough to make them realize uh, this sinful life isn't all that uh, it, it's sold as. It's not as good and as glamorous as people have made it out to be. And God is patient. He gives people ample time to repent. Now, when is the final day? I don't know, and neither do you. Uh, and neither does the sinner. And so I don't recommend putting it off until, uh, putting it off indefinitely. Uh, I think it's something that we should engage in. I think it's something that we should uh, be willing to talk about. But at the same time, uh, as long as it's still today, using some Hebrew, uh, book of Hebrew language, as long as it's still today, there's still time to repent. Wrapping it up here in verse 5. But because of your stubborn and unrepentant heart, this is the you that we've been talking about, Paul's been talking about since verse 1. Because of your stubborn and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verses 1 through 4 is presenting this you person, and this you person is storing up wrath for themselves for the judgment day. Now, I believe that every believer should take this section to heart and ask themselves some piercing questions regarding it. Do I treat God? Uh, th do I treat the grace of God? Do I treat the love of God? Do I treat the mercy of God as a get out of jail free card, as a go on sinning uh, and having a good time sinning because God is gracious, God is loving, and God is merciful? I think that that is this person that Paul is talking about here. Now, is Paul? about to get into some sort of works salvation, some sort of good works merit or uh, 
lead you to salvation. Well, here in the next chapter, Paul's going to specifically say that no flesh will be justified by observing the law. He's going, to go, he's going to go on to say that man is justified by faith apart from works. He's going to use Abraham and Abraham's faith in his uncircumcised state as a uh, illustration for what faith is. So no, Paul is not pointing towards a works salvation, nor am I trying to push some sort of works salvation. However, even our own culture has the, the idiom or the saying, actions speak louder than words. Words are cheap, and words, you can say whatever you want, but what do your actions really point to? What do your actions really say about you and about your views uh, in this life? And here's one of those times that I actually don't think the divide between James and Paul is actually that far apart course in the book of James chapter 2 verse 18 Paul uh, excuse me James is talking about faith and he's saying I will show you my faith by what I do and that's not unlike what Paul will eventually write when he writes Colossians uh, chapter 3 verse 5 uh, put to death worldly impulses such as immorality not using God's grace and God's love and God's God's mercy as a carte blanche to continue on sinning uh, and so with that I think that every Christian should take this to heart they should ask themselves uh, if I'm judging what kind of judging am I doing and two am I this kind of a person who who treats God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness in such a way that really I'm not experiencing it Somehow I'm uh, usurping or cir circumnavigating God's uh, purpose and actions in my life by choosing to continue to sin, but this whole time believing that I'm saved, uh, whatever that is. All right, with that, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to pick it up next time, uh, starting in verse 6, uh, and we're going to go to the end of the uh, section, verse 16. I hope you join us again, and uh, I'm going to keep on praying for you during this time. I hope you keep on praying for me during this time, and I just want to thank you so much.